Good morning, good evening, good night, NBN Entrepreneurship and Leadership. Personally, I'm fascinated by the story. Trust is an underrated weapon in the business landscape. I'm a really, really strong believer in learning by doing. What's the definition of success? He's trying to come up with an answer to the question. But go ahead, Richard. Well, you could be right, but you're wrong. <laughs> Good afternoon, good morning, good night, Entrepreneurship and Leadership Channel listeners on the NBN. I'm here with my co-host, Kim Fontakidis, and our guest, Dennis Zadanov, if I pronounce your name correctly, Dennis, is that correct? Almost got it right, Almost yes. Right. And I, I met Dennis at the TED conference a few weeks ago in Vancouver, but rather than me trying to, other than the fact that I know he's a highly accomplished entrepreneur, I'd like you, Dennis, to introduce yourself in 30 seconds or, or, or a minute, just in the way you would to a, a stranger you meet at a party or, or at a business event? Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm born and raised in Ukraine, and I um, left Ukraine at the age of 20 uh, to study in the UK. But at the age of, of 19, I joined um, my brother and his friends who just started a company around building apps for iOS, for Apple devices. And ever since, we've built a business around building great productivity apps on uh, for iPhone, iPad, and Mac. And uh, this year, we'll hit an amazing milestone of about 200 million users using our, our products. Um, and uh, I hope you, many of you have used our products, such as Scanner Pro or Spark Email or PDF Expert or Documents and Calendars. So think of, like, yeah, think of uh, us um, as a company who's, who's, who we're building amazing, easy to use and accessible technology products that help people just be a little bit more efficient and effective and save time while using Apple devices. So that's what we've been doing for the past 14 years, I assume. Which I guess makes you about 33, 34 years old at the moment. Is that right? I am 33. Yes, already. And one interesting fact, we were... When you think about our story, when we were talking about our story, we think that we've, we've never raised capital. So we've almost done things against the odds. That was kind of a weird combination of us being independent and bootstrapped, uh, yet profitable. And we managed to build business around building great products on the App Store. Hmm. Well, Akima and I very much appreciate the the sort of the, the bootstrapper do-it-yourself approach rather than the, the sort of pitching and burning through other people's money. But um, well, congratulations! That in in terms of like financial numbers, can you give a sense of what other people think your businesses might be worth, or whether you're a billionaire, a, a unicorn giant? Or, I am you know, not. I am not. So, uh, you know, and that bugs me a lot. So <laughs> I'm still working and a lot. And uh, as I mentioned, I, here I want to focus right now and getting more output and productivity. Um, but uh, we don't have the public numbers. And then being a private company, we don't disclose our numbers. Uh, there was no kind of evaluation event or there was no any, any round or acquisition, obviously. Um, so um, there is no evaluation, but I don't think we are uh, we're not a unicorn. Let's put it this way. Okay. So a, a lot of work to do. I have a question about the, uh, the, the fir we're obviously going to get back into your history and understand how you became, how you actually got into this. But like the first thing that, you were, that came to my mind when you were talking about this was like, the, you're basically part of this Apple development um, community infrastructure. And there has been, you know, obviously in the news you read about, you know, it, is that an issue? Is that an issue to your business model at all? Like that, that that somehow Apple takes like an unfair share of because I guess you make all your money through set through the App Store, and it, um, I'm not sure how uh, your whether it's like you have purchases or, uh, in 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 app purchases and stuff like that or like you know premium versions and stuff like that. But is 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 the Apple development community or the app community in general is that any does that concern you at all? I mean, it, uh, in any way, in terms of like a risk to your business model or something like that, because you're yeah. kind of dependent on them. Yeah, since we've been since we've been on the App Store, literally since they, I think one or two, right? Our first app, Riddle Docs, was launched in 2008. During this, the whole App Store revolution and the App Store came about to be, and for us, it was incredible distribution engine suddenly a small group of, of young 20-something-year-old <laughs> students, right? 
like created an app and that app has become available in 180 countries all over the world just being one click away from a user so i like i can appreciate and i do appreciate all the heavy lifting of distribution that apple has has done with the app store uh, and then of course that that's been 14 years ago right now there is this notion and i've been of course following this closely i think apple has introduced a lot of things that make it easier for developers. For example, if we have subscription and, and now we're finalizing our transition to subscription products uh, and, and, and apps, uh, for the second year of the subscription, if the user renews the subscription, Apple will charge not 30, but 15% okay. uh, for the app developers. And then they've introduced programs, for example, for smaller size developers who make below 1 million a year in revenue. Uh, I think they they charge them way less. I don't remember the exact number. Um, if you ask me as an entrepreneur, would I love um, not to pay thirty percent tax on what are we make like all the revenues that we're ma making? Yeah, that's that's a substantial number for us. So I think I think uh, the industry will self regulate. What I what I dislike about the uh, this whole notion and uh, what I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of bad players tricking people. Uh, into buying subscriptions without people knowing. And there's a lot of fraud. So what Apple brings, Apple brings that kind of security and, and trust towards the platform, right? And now if, if, if you will see all, all these different apps will be trying to charge people uh, like not in the app store, but in other ways, we might see a lot of bad actors so somehow the industries have to, to balance and I'm very uh, hopeful that it will. Um, so I think it's a process and we will see some changes in the next couple of years for sure. Mm -hmm. That's cool. But so basically 30% is a distribution fee and that makes sense. Like yeah. would you pay 30% to get Apple's distribution fee and then 15 if it's successful? <clears throat> I think it will, I think with, with, with time it will, it will go down. That's just my prediction. But I like the idea of, of having a secure, trusted place where I can just go and buy some products that are high quality, that I know are not scam, and it, that there is value in that. And for, for us developers, that kind of distribution across all the different right. platforms and, and countries, and we localized our products into nine major languages, that makes our reach even bigger. Right. And then the App Store editorial, uh, they work with developers to kind of to highlight the stories behind products, the use cases for, for, for users. And they also try to tailor the recommendation engine on the App Store. Um, so I think a lot of being done. Um, as I said, I'd love to pay less <laughs> and make more revenue, but we'll see. But, but I think there's a point for people listening that, you know, for a, a new kids on the block, if you're a new company with an idea, th this is an opportunity. It's really for the big established guys, the big games companies where their revenues are in the hundreds of millions. For them, that that 30% is a lot and maybe they've already established a brand and a presence. But for new, new guys who come along, of course, getting attention within the app store is difficult, but these big distribution platforms are more of an opportunity than a threat for new kids because you can get you can get the word out about the fact you exist to a global, or rather you get access to a global market. But um, anyway, also, I mean, yeah, it's also interesting, like Apple takes care of all the kind of all the uh, processing, payment processing and tax sure. and, and so on. So I, I'm sure you guys know and how, for example, if you want to sell something online, you know how to think, how to set up my payments, my Stripe, my VAT. Yeah, all that tax, stuff is taken And all the, the accounting, right? Like how you could create accounts and backend uh, and that's a lot of work. It's so if you're small, start a building product, you want to be building products, not mm. doing the boring stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's jump back. You you went to the UK when you were, I think you said 19 or 20 or something like that. But if you go back a bit earlier to your, your teenage years in, in the Ukraine, did you imagine that you were going to be an entrepreneur? Did you, did, did, did you have role models in your family or were your parents, were, were they surprised when you went into business? Or, or, I mean, just what was the context of your, your childhood and your inspirations? I think nobody was surprised. And uh, I clearly had a role model. Uh, his name was uh, Dave Ogilvy. I, I really wanted to, to run a, a marketing agency. I love marketing since a very young age. And that was a role model, but then uh, and even when I when I did my my masters, I picked kind of business uh, and marketing. Um, 
and then with heavy, heavy focus on marketing. And I, I just loved all the things around marketing, especially the aspects of kind of thinking what the world needs and how do we create a story to educate the world. Uh, I much prefer the word educate rather than sell. Um, educating people, it, it has more empathy, it, it, it's more human and you understand what people might need. And then here you are, came up with this product that people just want to pay for. That's out of the, how they vote. Um, so, and then um, when I was doing my master's, Riddle was already, I think, one or two years old. So um, I was kind of, I, I told out of the guys, hey, like I really want to, to help. I love marketing and you can, you can use some help. Um, and that was just very natural. And I was kind of working at night, uh, part-time and helping, helping our, our company uh, and then studying during the day. And um, that was kind of, and, and that was a beautiful mix of how my passion towards marketing and my education there um, came, like, became very important and valuable uh, in, our, in our company very early on because the majority of um, the, 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 the founders, four of four founders at Riedel, um, two of them were technical, Igor is my, is my brother who's a CEO, he is uh, kind of all encompassing around the business and then the Alex, Alex is a product guy. So me coming up with a marketing perspective and being naturally, um, I believe a good communicator um, and it's easy for me to make friends with people and tell stories and uh, tell what we're we doing. It was a very natural fit. So somehow like all the roles that were needed very early on were filled almost organically with our strengths and, and uh, kind of uh, we balanced our strengths and weaknesses and there was synergy very early on. I'm curious, um, I'm naive when it comes to, I never developed an app for the app store. So I don't, I don't know, actually, I, I've never sold anything via the app store. So I don't know anything. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously a user, I, I'm an Apple user. I buy via the app store, but uh, so I'm just trying to imagine what is it marketing? Like if your main distribution channel is the app store, what is the, I feel like I'm asking a really stupid and obvious question, but like, what's the role of marketing? That's, in, that's an amazing question. Right? <laughs> it, 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 like, is it, you just even said, like, I think in this pre, in, in, at the beginning you were saying, well, the Apple editorial, they help position us. They help show us what the story is. What's the role of marketing when you're like your main distribution channel is the app store. I, I, um, so we can, that's a very good question, right? And, and my role in the company uh, was historically at, um, a, it's what's called VP of marketing, think of CMO. We don't have, um, and right now I, I stepped down a year and a half ago from my executive role and now I'm on the board. I think I forget to mention this. So okay. now <laughs> I'm not operationally involved, even though I do help right now with a lot of things. But when you think about marketing, what I, what I think, when I think about marketing, I, as I mentioned, I think marketing starts with day on day zero, understanding what the world needs, understanding what is the timing, what's the trend out there, what are people willing to pay for? And, um, you know, that there's like nothing changed uh, if we like even go to older books and classics by um, Kotler and other things, they describe what marketing is. So, so marketing starts in day zero when you try to understand what kind of product the world would, would need and what do people want to buy, right? Uh, so, but when it comes to marketing apps, uh, I see like at least three distinctive uh, periods starting 2008, 2017, and now. So we can briefly go through all of them and, and to give kind of a, a, an idea of how times have changed. So anyways, very early on, marketing was very easy and we are we think our, ourselves as a product-led company. So a product, a good product that works, that does the job is the best marketing tool. And people get it, they use it, they say, hey, that's an amazing app, right? Like for example, somebody used PDF expert to sign a document or change the text or dates in, in their documents and they loved it and it works and simple and intuitive and they recommend their friends. So with PDF Expert, that's our flagship product, up to 30% of all the new users are coming from the friends recommendation. So that's very high. So 
I was kind of in a lucky position to be that we have good products and marketing good products is so much easier. So back in the day, there was like some limited channels, but okay, what worked? Um, Apple editorial did work, but before they noticed us, we needed to get some amazing products and also get some press. So press back in the day, I'd say from 2008 to 2014, did work amazingly well to drive downloads, to drive attention, and people would actually go and get the app. Not anymore. Um, just kind of a spoiler, not anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, so, and, and back in the day, apps and iPhones and app stores were kind of a new shiny thing and people loved exploring, right? And then the market had saturated in 2000, I'd say 14, 15, 16. Yeah. And, and, and kind of getting that a person to get the one extra app is super was super hard so anyways first first era that was very kind of product-led marketing great products clear positioning clear communication what the product does who is it for and why it's amazing or why it's different right so three things you make those clear you show a product it's easy to understand it's easy to use and people just get it and recommend their friends um, press it really did well. And that's why, um, I spent half of my time trying to get, uh, a word out, uh, about us. And especially given that, that we were like a tiny little startup from Odessa, which is, uh, on a black sea of Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll have to compete with all the bigger, bigger guys and bigger companies and who raised huge venture rounds. Or if you notice our portfolio, we, we, and Many of those categories have very strong like platform leaders. Think of like Spark email, right? We're competing with all the guys like Gmail, there's yeah. Apple Mail, there's Outlook, um, or you think about even PDF experts. Um, PDF is owned by Adobe. So, so, um, so press worked really well there. Um, and then there was another, another period when what I witnessed that press didn't work that well to drive downloads. People, I think, had enough of, 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 of apps. Uh, but what did work well with press is that from 2016 onwards, that would actually get you more eyeballs and people would know about your product and your company. So it made, made it easier to hire amazing people and also raise capital. Well, we you didn't raise press. Capital. I mean, you mean getting some kind of a review? Like I, I, when I think about how I buy apps, like I'll Google best efficient, best yeah. something. And then yeah. I'll so, get to TechCrunch or somewhere like that. And it'll give me a absolutely. top 10 list of the best apps. Like, so are you trying to get yourself on those lists? When you say press, we were, that- we were, we were yeah. on all of those lists. We were yeah. reviewed by even New York Times say, yeah. prob- they had this article saying probably the best way to scan your um, documents. That was our scanner pro right there as being kind of the best one. And uh, there was a whole era, the movement of people like geeking around different products and, yeah. and different uh, podcasts and, and, and media and those articles, hey, these are like 10 best apps or that's the best app to, for students or that's the best app to edit your PDF files or that's the best email app. So I knew all these people throughout the years and uh, they loved our products and uh, getting on all these lists, I think early on, helped us a lot and I've even helping now to drive this, this, this ins- amazing amount of, of, of people organically, like f- figuring out what they want and, and finding us online. So kind of we established a very strong presence. Later on, I think um, SEO, search optimization, um, I, I, did, I did focus on that for, for a year or two uh, for PDF experts and it did work really well. So for example, if you Google right now on your Mac, um, added PDF on Mac would be number one on, on, okay. uh, so, on our, so you have landing pages and then get it at the app store and basically, yeah, yeah. That's- very like we have, uh, we have, um, I'd say very basic stuff, uh, but of course they are optimized and, uh, SEO, we can talk about SEO for a long, long time. So <laughs> that was a channel and, and, um, but interestingly enough, I don't know if I mentioned all, almost all of those downloads that I said, um, we have about 190 million this year. We will have 200 million this year. Uh, we have 190 now and have 200 million this year. 
majority of them are organic. So we, we didn't do enough of paid marketing. And, and uh, there was a very good reason for that. But, uh, and that's an opportunity, even though we're kind of late. So now we're, we're coming to an interesting phase where like, I'd say 2017 to 2020, 21, I think this, this was a golden era of this, uh, of for any entrepreneur who wants to sell stuff online. The rise of Shopify, uh, Instagram ads, Facebook ads. All you had to do is just <laughs> is just to create a good landing page, put a product there, and then uh, and then figure out how to run ads efficiently, right? So many people would be, there was an evolution of the app store as well. Many people switch their apps to subscription, and that dramatically increases the uh, lifetime value uh, of of these products and, and how much. Uh, companies and developers are getting paid by by the users and we did not do that right away because it for us it felt not fair to the user think about this right you've been buying scanner pro which is like a premium product for seven dollars one-time purchase right and then what what many people have done they just said okay we will now charge people for uh, like we'll charge them three dollars per, per per month for the same products just because they could. And that's where the whole industry shifted. And we didn't follow because we thought it's just not fair. We cannot sell the same value to the user and then charge them 10 times more. So, and also- You couldn't grandfather that, in, you couldn't grandfather in the ones that already paid the seven bucks and then with new ones. Uh, you yeah, know. it's, it's, we, we, Technically, we could. It's just we thought, okay, we have to create something of a much bigger value that is we it's believe worth that the, product, it's worth the thirty six bucks basically. Exactly, and then yeah. Yeah. right, and then and then think we think of this this way: if you want to charge a customer um, a recurring fee, you have to provide a recurring value, right? So it's it's about the nature of the product, the usage of the products. So it took us a couple of years for actually for all the product teams to upgrade and deliver way more value. And only after that, we switched to subscription, which was already too late, to be honest. Um, I'm not talking about just success, but also some kind of <laughs> Good. Not failures, right? But that's a missed opportunity. Because uh, I know some numbers uh, for similar companies who just copied our products and uh, just marketed the heck of it using, using social and uh, Instagram and, and uh, Facebook ads charging sometimes ridiculous prices just like 399 per week for example for a scanner app right and 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 yeah. and buying fake reviews that's not who we are that's not what we do and that's not the right way of doing things um, that's our like firm beliefs but those guys made a lot of money so so i think that was a, like a it was a good era um for anybody the entrepreneurs who can build products that are good enough and selling them was so much easier. So the main channel, like for uh, for apps, uh, from what, I've, what we've seen, uh, was mainly uh, paid media and performance marketing. And then there is now when I think you guys, I don't know if you follow the the whole uh, beef of Facebook and Apple when mm -hmm. Apple uh, they shut down the the big part of analytics. Uh, so right now it's not, e it's not as easy and profitable right. to market. Right. Apps. So I see a lot of people, um, a lot of people actually kind of canceling their performance marketing or just lowering the budgets in a big, big way. Cause it's, it's hard to see the results and, and, and understand the ROI of that. Um, and I, and I think right now, uh, the industry will pivot into something else as well, uh, with big impact on social in terms of the in like think about God, think about of like i think of the next phase of marketing would be mostly personal recommendations and people that you trust and i'm not talking about just influencers like big guys with 15 million subscribers i'm talking about hundreds and thousands of we call them micro influencers who have much much better connection who are way more relatable yeah. to somebody, right? You almost know them. What's your definition what... of a micro? I'm just, because I am kind of curious in this. Yeah. Is, like, how many people do they need to have to call them a micro influencer? I, I think, I, think uh, I don't know the exact number, but 10K? 
10k, 10k to yeah. 100k would be a micro influencer. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think there will be something around that. And mm. um, I've seen some crazy stories on TikTok and how my friend's company, they do some beauty products and this like random person that they had no idea of, like filled the TikTok video that became viral. So they sold out all their stock and they were like out of stock for two months because <laughs> one video and then he sold the company. So um, <laughs> good timing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Break it so, rich. Um, so, so we're seeing a lot of uh, new stuff coming and it's, it's beautiful. It's even more noisy and competitive though. So that's why I think we're coming kind of back to the very basis of marketing, understanding what is your unique value proposition why the people would need this. So mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about, I don't want to like, Richard, I'm sure you have some things you want to ask, but I am very actually interested in this. The, the micro-influencer strategy. Can you just talk a little bit about, so like, what do you, how do you capitalize? How, well, oh. how do you do it? I mean, what's I'll the, be what's very the- honest. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we've missed, like we've missed the whole, the whole like five, four to five years of this performance marketing. Yeah. Oh, because of the reasons that I told you, we couldn't yeah, just yeah, yeah, ramp yeah. up the prices and yeah, sell yeah, yeah. what we had. So, uh, so micro influencers, the way I think is that make a product that has, if you think about TikTok, um, do, do you familiar with the term that's called product market fit? Yes. yes. Yeah. So when you think about TikTok, think about the term product visual fit. So TikTok ah, it's is be... a very visual um, platform, right? And um, and 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 that's that's you might think of. Okay, that might actually affect the way you do your product, and um, and 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 um, so the way I can share some stuff that, that my friends has done on on micro influencer stuff. So uh, they do find people who can make amazing content on TikTok, for example, and they don't have to have followers at all because of the unique TikTok algorithm. You don't have to have crazy amount of followers and Hmm. your video still might be picked up. So for example, remember the story that I told you about this one crazy viral video that sold out stock for two months. I think the girl who did that video had like nine followers and the video got more than 10 million views. So that's the beauty of TikTok. So they've assembled the whole team, I think of four to five people full-time who would then go and find people who can make those videos for a very affordable price. Like anywhere, think of anywhere from two to 500 US dollars per video. Right. And they would pay, um, and they would go to micro-influencers, as I said, anywhere from 10 to, to 100K, and then just, just do that. I know it's hard to track, um, but uh, the beauty is that once you have a kind of big enough um, social, almost like a, a kind of a cultural shift that this becomes a, a thing. Uh, I don't know if you if you've noticed, but a couple of months ago there was a massive trend on um, TikTok on how young people use Notion, and using Notion to organize your life has become a cool thing to do. And everybody was sharing how they customize this or customize that and their templates. And hmm. I love when people create something that becomes almost a part of culture. You know, it's, hmm. it becomes a cool thing. Like one of the biggest examples of, of how something can become a culture uh, that I have highest admiration is, of course, uh, F1 racing, how they become a part of culture and it changed everything. Second would be, there was this Netflix show about um, the chess. I forgot uh, the name of it. The Queen's Gambit. Yes, exactly. Right. And I don't know if you've seen what has that show has done to sales of, of the chess boards across the world. They were sold out. And, and I think chess, what's the, I'm not sure if it's chess.com, but one of those like places where they got scores and they compete against you that are also, I think I got tremendous yeah. In, in, in in influx in popularity mm-hmm. as well because yeah. so yeah. you're saying it's a long complicated game you're taking all these different pieces and components mm-hmm. to make to, to get there so, so what I, what i'm personally fascinated with is kind of building a product that resonates with the times right it's called almost like the zeitgeist product fit 
Like it resonates with the wind of time. What is in the air? I'm not saying that we should just follow all the trends. No, but being able to create a trend, being able to create that kind of cultural shift, that's like that's the my personal aspiration. Um, we've been very lucky um, in a way with the trend of apps back in the day. Um, and uh, I think that there is an evolution already. Um, and, um, and, and um, yeah. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions. Um, one, I wanted to dig back into the sort of underdog story that Kimon and I, both, neither of us are from Poland, but we're both Polish citizens. And, you know, there was a time when Poland was the underdog. And obviously, you know, Ukrainian brothers showing up in the States, um, I'm, I'm curious about whether you felt that it was an advantage to sort of like coming from Odessa, it, it's sort of you're, you, you don't have the same privileges. So to see you're, you're sort of hard word to try harder. So that's like one question. The second one's about the relevance of things like TikTok to business to business marketing, which is a completely separate question. But so let's maybe, like Richard, let me advise just maybe one question at a time. Okay. So yeah, let, let, let's um let's just like did you did you consciously feel that you and uh, as uh, Ukrainian guys were like it was an advantage that you came from came off the off the grid into this American thing or, or were Ukrainians quite well established in the American ecosystem. So you just ignored it. So I'll be very honest, uh, Richard, I didn't think about that. Hmm. I was so curious on what we're doing and I loved it so much that I think this curiosity and love and fire in my eyes that opened so many doors because, and especially I think you, um, the Silicon Valley is a unique place as I'm sure you, know, you both know. And when you have somebody new and fresh coming in Silicon Valley, of, uh, then you have this kind of extra credits for being new and, and, and interesting. So I was, wasn't thinking about, oh, are we the underdog? Oh, how's my accent? Like, or things like that. I was so into what we're doing and I was so eager to show the world um, on, hey, like we've got this amazing app, you should check this out. And uh, I had to be very creative on how do I reach out to people? But also I realized that like, and, and I have some strict rules on what I believe on how the relationship should go. And I can share those, of course. And I think it's very helpful for um, people who are just starting. Sure, go ahead. Go um, for it. Yeah. So, so first of all, think I, I always approach relationships as not something that I, that I get myself, but I'm trying to give to a person. For, so, for example, when you, let's go back to things, uh, just a good example. When I, when I was approaching journalists and media guys, um, on, on kind of how can they write about us. Um, so the best way is to understand what are they looking for? Like, right, I'm trying to be helpful. I'm trying to provide details. Maybe they need some information about the new rules of the app store. Maybe they, they've, been, they've been writing about this topic that I know something about that I can just contribute. So I build a relationship by contributing to their work and making their work better and sometimes easier for them, like kind of giving them feedback and data and opinions that which they valued. And only after that, I can ask something, hey, we're launching this new product. How about you check this out? And, and this is why it's amazing. Here is the demo. And that really worked. And I think that's that comes into every relationship. And almost I, I, I when I now brief uh, some of the uh, PR folks that, that do that at Riedel, I, I say, hey, if you do 95% of their work and so they can just like almost, almost rely, like stand on your shoulders and make it easy for them. So make exactly. it easy for people to do their job and to like, to be great. And it's not just in PR, it's everywhere. It's that principle. So be helpful. Um, I mean, sort of be helpful. be helpful, right? Be helpful. Like, Oh, okay. Um, it does require your rigor and uh, dedication and understanding of the context, of course. But um, I think what was good for me personally and for us is that coming from, as in kind of the underdog, we were not, like, we did not have a lot of resources. So I had to be very creative. How do we get New York Times or like, how do we get hire this person? How do we um, achieve our goals? not in kind of not in a ways that but that we would approach have we had for example the money or like the, the easiest examples i'm just keep coming back to pr because it's very easy very 
easy to, to understand what I mean. Um, we didn't hire an agency that we paid 20,000 pounds per, per, per month retainer to do something for us. No, like, and we didn't have this money. And then we had to be creative and, 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 and that also happened to be that journalists and media, they love talking to founders. They love talking to people who make decisions and, and here we are, and it was easier. So I think we had to find ways how to create better products, better business and overcome constraints with less resources. And that's an amazing skill to have for everybody. Definitely. I mean, and you're comp, I mean, like, but you're not a tip. We can, you can say you're a typical, but you're not a typical guy. I mean, you're just, you, you, cause you just went, you know, you just went there and you did the, I, it, it's nice the way, the way you say it, it sounds so easy, <laughs> but it's, but, yeah, but I it is hard. I, but I, I, I am taking away for people listening though. I mean, that you shouldn't feel like uh, Richard asked it and sort of contextualize it as the underdog, but like, you should, you should just, you shouldn't care about that. You should just yeah, be passionate absolutely. about what, you should be passionate about what you're doing. So um, I think, I think that's a very important point, especially to young, young entrepreneurs. One of my friends, like a couple of years ago told me like, Dennis, I was so amazed on how you could just confidently walk into the room full of billionaires who are like building the biggest companies in the world and be almost like on the same level talking to them, even though like you're not, like your company is not as big, you're not as well known. Um, he's like, I would be shy and I would be confused and conflicted. I don't know. I, I, I never have the thoughts. I was always curious. Like, yeah, oh, there are people. So I mean, cool. they're all people. I, I, I agree with you, but, but it's interesting because it's not typical. I don't D- think but did, typical. were you always like that? I mean, you, you came back, you yeah. were always interested yeah. in marketing. Like when you were 10, you were 12, you were, you were, oh, yeah. you, you were self-confident. And was that That's your true. upbringing or is your brother like that too? Was that your genetics? Or? We are, we're pretty different. We're pretty different, even even though like we have the, our we have like the same parents and we were grown in the same like raised in the same family. Uh, we are very different, and I think that's the personal personality trait that that came out to be very very early on in my life. And uh, um, I'm thankful for my parents. I was trying to kind of decompose like how did it happen that I have um, that I was just confident. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's just a mix of everything. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's, that's, I think being, being, being curious about something. So I, I love this phrase. I love this, I love this quote. So the most interesting people are not trying to be interesting. They are so interested in something. So, be, and because of this interest, uh, they uh, are being interesting to others. When you exactly. so exactly. in and that's, that, something. That's, that's the thing. And actually in sale, like whatever, you may have been doing sales. We're, ever, we're all doing sales one way or another. Uh, I know you don't like the word, but the truth is that's, that's actually just caring about the thing. It, it, truly caring about the thing. It's huge. It's like it makes it like people want to buy <laughs> if you care. Actually, it's amazing how much that works. Actually, and there's another point I'd make that if someone's listening to this and they're feeling sort of a little sad because they're thinking, well, Dennis is like that and he did really well, and I'm not like that. The thing to remember is you don't have to be like that. You just have to have someone in your team who's got that characteristic that you you said you're a bit different from your brother. So obviously you had the like. Can you talk a bit about you know, how far you put the success of the company towards like a few key people or was it the culture or you know what, what was it you know obviously you and your brother were different and having family is always very unique but you mentioned four founders did you feel that you managed to create a system to attract attract good people into the into the business as well uh yes but then it doesn't mean that we didn't have challenges as we grew right now we're about 250 people right and then and that it was at the beginning it was just very easy to attract people who care, who love what they do. And it's absolutely fine, as you said, to be different. Somebody is a great engineer and I don't know nothing about engineering. I mean, I know some basics, but I cannot be a great engineer and that's fine, right? And that's the beauty of the team. So we did grow organically as a team and we had, I, I think we, we have a unique culture where very flat, super flat, um, cool ideas one, win and won, um, focusing on like, like crazy focus on the user and trying to understand how to make things easier. I know these are all cliche and everybody says that, but like, you have to live that. 
Uh, so, and, and just the, this curiosity, okay, there is iPad coming. We've heard rumors about iPad coming and we don't know what size. So what we've done, we've took like, um, we designed ourselves, we took our sisters and we like took cardboard and we almost like made like three different sizes of iPads that we think will have the size. And we started sketching with a pencil, the user interface and the user scenarios on those cardboards with our pencil before the iPad came about. So that's just the, that curiosity. And that was across the whole team. And uh, our CTO and co-founder, Andrian, is a phenomenal engineer. Like, you know, like, um, I don't want to use cliches, but those kind of 10x engineers that, that people talk about, he was just that, right? Igor understands how business works and took care of, of, of everything that relates to finance, hiring, legal, and that gave me an ability to not think about that and do what I'm good at is understanding, okay, how do we like, what are we selling? Who are we selling to? How do we tell the world? And that just takes, and it was very organic. And, and so the company grew with, with, that, with that culture. I think every company goes through, through stages and, um, and we are as well. So with growth, there comes a lot of things and challenges that we have to overcome. I wouldn't say that we are, like we're scoring A pluses and all of those even now we're learning. And uh, with more people, of course, you have to have processes, kind of basic stuff, right? Processes. And the culture is not that apparent as before you just walk into the office or before they have, we had an office, we had a, a four bedroom apartment. You walk in there, you see everybody, you, you, you understand what's up. But, but um, now, especially with the pandemic, like think about the complexity of the onboarding and giving the, the gist of culture to the new person. And therefore we have to formalize a lot of things. We have to think about, okay, how do we, how do we talk about our culture? Because before you just feel it, right? And you either fit or you don't. And, and now it's, it's, there is more complexity, way more complexity. That's why right now we're hiring, we're looking for um, um, head of like VP of talent. So, so it's kind of to right now we have to uh, think about being very explicit on do's and don'ts, what we are. Oh doing. my God, HR, I know all about that. It's such a pain in the yeah, ass, I hate yeah. it. So, so, but, uh, so <laughs> that, that's, as I say, I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very open, not just wins, but also some challenges. That, uh, that's one of the challenges for sure. What I have to ask, cause I'm just now really curious. Like, so where are you, where are these 300? Like, so are, are you remote? based are you are yeah, you because so, you talked about how the challenges with the remote culture and then or and then did you was this all based in in, in odessa or where where, where, where so are you guys like historically how, where are the 300 people historically it's 250 um oh, and historically we were the hq was in odessa as we grew we realized that kiev is an amazing source of of, of talent and uh, it's capital and more people um and so we open office there and then very early on, we realized that, okay, we're a global player. We have to, we have to sell globally. So that's why Igor, our CEO, um, he's made this decision back in 2011 that we will be spending money on our trips to the US, on our trips to London. The people who make decisions have to be exposed to cultures. So that's how and some, like we were going to all the conferences there um, and uh, we've opened um, actually a Berlin office, and then we've opened this platform, this uh, program that allowed people to go and live in Berlin for a month and just be there, be in that, go to the office and we work and then uh, kind of see the culture. We've opened, um, um, we've opened also uh, the office in, in Silicon Valley. We shut that down sometime, some time ago. But we were always like trying like to say, hey, you cannot just be, sitting in one place and understand the culture. So, you I mean, like, so just for people listening, this is uh, May, 2022. There is yeah. a war going on in Ukraine yeah. at the moment. How is that? Like, I can't even imagine how, like, so you're mostly still in Ukraine. I mean, the most of the people are. Uh, no. Um, no, right now we're scattered across 27 countries. Okay. And we're building hubs in uh, Berlin, Lisbon. I think London office is coming up. 
we have a Dubai presence as well. So, so you're um, not that exposed to the, you have not been that exposed. This is not from a business perspective. Obviously I'm sure personally, this is terrible, but from a business I, I think perspective. Before the war, the majority of, our, of, of the regional team was in Ukraine. So it was, we were okay. very exposed. Wow. Yeah. So you guys have been we're through, <laughs> but we're talking three months. Exposed. I mean, you guys have been through a crazy, crazy period of time. And uh, yeah, this whole situation is, um, is, is, is very hard for everybody. Um, yeah. And um, so, but yeah, right now where the team has done a lot to, uh, to help with through various campaigns, those who are in need. Um, we still, we're, to, we're lucky and privileged, um, not privileged, like lucky that our business is not that affected because our user base and, and customers are across the world. And right. I'd say about 35 to 40% are in the US and then 25 right, to 30 right, right, are right. In, in Europe. So uh, the business is stable. All our, yeah. um, it's safe because all, all our servers are secure with the Amazons and Googles right. uh, in Europe and the US. But then just just helping people in need and, and, and organizing the logistics, you can just only begin yes, to imagine. I can't even know. I can't actually, I cannot yeah. even begin to imagine, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah. I cannot even begin to imagine that. Okay, just to shift maybe, because we're running out of time, you're doing something new and I want to hear, I'm sure we all want to hear what you're doing. You're setting up a new business, you said. And, and, uh, yeah. and, and, and the, as well as what it is, what the motivation is, because you said you were non-executive, so maybe you didn't like being, <laughs> obviously you made a change to so say like, why did you quit? The, uh, you're, you tried to quit, but you're still actually working. <laughs> yeah, um, that's true. That's true. Uh, a couple of things. I, I've been, I've been, uh, the, I've been in this position for, and running this for about, 10 to 11 years. And uh, I realized that I want to be a serial entrepreneur. I want to start new businesses and I want to build great, great businesses. And then, because I'm so curious about life, there's so many, so many things to build, so many things to do. And that's one. Number two, at that stage, uh, remember how I told you that we didn't do performance marketing and uh, I had no experience in doing that. I'm, my strengths are in something, something else. So we, uh, I've made a decision, okay, if we want to focus on, on, on actually ramping up our scale stage, we need somebody to, who has done it. So, so that's why one of the reasons uh, I stepped down, I said, hey, like we need somebody who has experience in this. And if that can affect the business in, 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 in more meaningful ways, this should happen. And I think uh, that's, um, that's a great, that's, that, that's great when people have, have no ego and then they just care about running, building a great business, right? Um, so, so a couple of things that, that these are a couple of things that uh, made allowed me to make the decision, and um, and yeah. So, and then I took a couple of months off, not doing something that was very unusual, and I failed on my sabbatical, as I as I joke around. So, I, I was hoping for like six months, but then I spent like two months of. Uh, it's not even sabbatical. It's just kind of reading books and uh, kind of uh, reflecting on things. And then um, I, you know, we've been building, I've been building productivity apps for 10 years and I love all the things about productivity and efficiency and optimization. Um, just, and the whole, the, the end goal is just to be, is just to live an amazing life. So one of my, my, my when people ask me, what do I want? I say, Hey, I, I want to live out of all the options that I can live my life, I want to live an amazing life that I'm happy about. And um, so based on that, I started like kind of this uh, research as a hobby, like kind of a pet project um, that's called MIFE. And the idea is that to, to explore whether we can build a life operating dashboard, a life, life, life dashboard for someone. I mean, I'm building this for myself. And uh, kind of do because there are so many things happening in life for, for all of us. And for me, it's crazy that if you think about the company. It, the company usually has a vision, a mission, uh, your KPIs and OKRs, and kind of performance management systems. And we as humans, like many of us don't. And I said, okay, I want to have more clarity uh onto what i'm doing where is my focus on and how do, can i achieve things faster better so and my life my life my life yeah okay. yeah yeah um so it's just 
for now, it's passion project, complete hobby for now, but I'm exploring and talking to a lot of people, doing interviews, trying to understand how do people um, approach a goal setting organization. It started simple. It started from, from simple like goal setting for a for year, right? That people have think of like um, New Year's resolution, resolutions on steroids. And then it evolved because I have kind of this, I'm exposed to technology and I said, okay, can we build something? Can technology help us to basically stay on track and connect our bigger goals and vision, what we want to achieve with everyday tasks that we kind of do every day in our calendar? And um, the short answer, I've got some, some uh, ruthless feedback. <laughs> People told me, Dennis, this is like way over engineered and uh, whether it's like I, everybody loves the idea, but actually doing that is, requires a lot of time and uh, commitment and people don't always have that it's funny how people usually uh, plan their holiday more like better than their life but that's just a different <laughs> topic um so so there's one that's pure hobby and there's another one the new company that uh, my friend got me in and i'm co-founded already we're building surprisingly enough um we're building a platform to sell your luxury watch so that would be the uh, platform that allows you to sell your luxury watch. That's a very uh, targeted market, I guess. Sorry? You, that's a very targeted market. You you must have done the, you know what the demographic is. I mean, I, it must be a very specific, the luxury watch, whatever, resale sect. That's, that's what it is, right? The like the, it's, it's yeah, the eBay it's, luxury watches. I mean. Um, so uh, I was surprised. I didn't know much about this industry, but right. again, being curious about all the things it's 25 billion a year. Exactly. It's that's what I was wondering. Well. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's hilarious. For, that's for you know, that's the secondary market. That's not like that's not the like the official dealers that they sell on right, like right. brand new. That's like the kind of re resell. But that's huge. And uh, the product uh, I was assembled the team. Product is ready. And uh, this week, next week, we will be doing soft launch. So super excited about that. Cool. Very cool. Well, I, 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 we obviously you're a very busy guy. Do please, uh, we will share. If you send, send us a batch of links, and we'll share everything in the in the show notes to go out with the with the podcast. Just, just before we wrap, is there anything that you haven't shared? And I think you've done an incredible job of getting across a really a really attractive, interesting, inspiring story. And I hope someone somewhere can. I'm sure many people can even just pick up one thing from your story. That would be great. But is there anything you haven't shared with? us and our listeners that you that you also think is important that you'd like to get out there just before we wrap yeah i didn't i didn't show that i would love to get some feedback on uh, the idea of my life because uh, this is still a beta so whoever loves the idea of kind of the organizing life and living more um having with more clarity and how can we connect uh, kind of higher goals with like everyday tasks all the all ideas are welcome i'm yeah just i'm actually prepared. personally very interested in that i'm one of these like productivity type Optimizer. We, should, we should jump on, on, a, on yeah, a call. I have like, you know, with the, I really got into this thing and all that stuff. And that's just one piece. And I think that there's, this is just the health piece. And I'm sure there's a lot of other, Yeah. sorry, yeah. I'm pointing to this. If you're on the podcast, I'm pointing to my Apple watch. Just so I'll, I'll tell a couple of stories. I don't normally tell, tell about Kimon that we've been doing business for 20 years. And one of our elite deals, I invested in a company that he started. And I just remember at like one minute to nine, five months after the deal, Kimon rang and said, Richard, you owe me 40,000 Swati. And it was like, it was in his calendar. And then, then like in August, we were in some meeting and the reminder popped up in his diary, which was get my boiler serviced, like my heating system serviced for the winter. He said, of course I did it in August. There's never a queue. You know, you just get it done. It's easy. You wait till October like everyone else does. And it's you know, just these little things to do with that. Kim was extremely well organized. And I think he, he, he will. No, but I'm into injured. the life thing. I'm into the life. I like the life aspect of it. And then can tech actually, can, are there some kind of algorithms or things that can help us sort of, and then what you said is I have big goals and how do I break them down into little goals? Um, I think it's a great, I think yeah, just fundamentally, it's a great idea. I have no idea how you would do it, but whatever. I'd be happy to talk to you about no, it. No, I'm, I'm happy. Let's just uh, probably organize a call next week or when you have time and we just, I'll show it. And I just want to say everybody, thank you so much for listening. And hopefully some of it was useful and interesting, um, but uh, I'm, I'm very open. You can find me on socials and Twitter. And if I can be somehow helpful, doing intro or like entering you to investors or potential colleagues or co-founders or anything just yeah feel free to reach out mm -hmm. 
Cool. All right. Thanks, Dennis, for your time. And thank you to the viewers who took the time to listen to us. And obviously, thanks to all the people that help us with this podcast. We've got engineers and people behind the scene making sound and video. And of course, the NBN, which uh, distributes this. So thanks to everybody. If you like this, uh, follow on social, on uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, like, subscribe, comment. Adios, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.